Well, <laughs> hello everyone. Uh, welcome back from <laughs> those who have. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, my name is Miriam Bay. Um, this year I've been in the art education department. Um, and I guess I also have to give a bit of background to my scholarship. Um, I have, I guess, a literature background. And um, I started to think about um, Pan-Africanism because I was thinking a lot about African literature. Uh, and because of that, I started to also think about blackness because uh, Pan-Africanism and the diaspora, it's sort of inseparable. So I started to think about blackness and I'm specifically as a researcher, as a writer, very interested in blackness within Africa um, to think about uh, what that idea means for black people on the continent. So my research this year um, is cosmopolitan approaches to curating um, blackness. And I get the word. So there's a, a, a lot of poetry and music and art. Uh, so yeah, the, um, I get the word cosmopolitan from um, a book called Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination by Robin D.G. Kelly, and he writes, she simply wanted us to live through our third eyes, to see life as possibility. She wanted us to imagine a world free of patriarchy, a world where gender and sexual relations could be reconstructed. She wanted us to see the poetic and prophetic in the richness of our daily lives. She wanted us to visualize a more expansive, fluid, cosmopolitan definition of blackness to teach us that we're not merely inheritors of a culture, but its makers. So um, I'm interested in this cosmopolitan definition of blackness and um, to think of curating as sort of uh, making the culture as well. Um, and um, so I'm going to focus on these two exhibitions, when we're in clouds gather and when we see us. Uh, but before I get into them, I just, uh, how I came to work with these two exhibitions is at the beginning of the year, I saw When Rain Clouds Gather, and I was very impressed by the exhibition and the curatorial strategies that the curators used. For example, using um, Bessie Head's uh, When Rain Clouds Gather as a title, and they had like the book right there at the start of the exhibition. And I started to think about, in the recent past, there's been a couple of exhibitions that are focusing on black artists, on blackness. Um, and here I have one from 1980, and these two are very recent, 2020, 2019 and 2022. Um, and from 1980, Culture and Resistance Festival in Botswana, uh, everything was beautiful and nothing hot. That was last 2021 in Joburg and a black aesthetic as well. So there's a number of exhibitions that are focusing on black artists and blackness. Um, and thinking with this idea of curators as making the culture as well, it's not just curatorial activism of thinking of um, getting black artists that are unknown and getting them to be seen. I think, um, especially in the recent exhibitions that are 2020s, I guess, it's more that these exhibitions are making certain statements about blackness, like When We See Us focuses uh, very specifically on joy and they uh, constantly repeat that that's a narrative that they're trying to do. So um, I think with uh, exhibitions focusing on blackness. I think there's uh, certain statements that they are making about blackness. They are redefining the ways that we can think about blackness. They are troubling the ways that we think about blackness. They are complicating the ways that we think about blackness. Um, so this presentation is going to be in four or five parts, depending on the time that we have. Um, 
and I'm just going to go through uh, very particular terms that I've come to think with uh, while thinking about these exhibitions. And this is an idea I came up with in conversation with Rory because he thinks fast with images and I think fast with words. And we thought it would be interesting if I could come up with certain words that uh, could be helpful to think about the exhibition. So, yeah. Um, but before I get into the terms, um, I just want to say um, that in all of my thinking and my writing this year and all of the time, uh, I'm very informed by Audre Lorde uh, and a particular text that has been uh, important is Audre Lorde's 1978 paper that was titled Users of the Erotic, um, The Erotic as Power. Uh, and it was delivered at a conference on the history of women. And that's important for me to mention because um, I realized this towards the end when I was about to submit my thesis that uh, both of these exhibitions are curated by uh, black feminists. I don't know if Tandazani makes a claim to that, uh, but I do know that Posha and Nonto do make a claim to uh, black feminism even in their practice. Um, and I also realized that the artists whose work I'd chosen to focus on are also, uh, they focus in their work on black women. And I was like, okay. Um, so it was very important, for, while I was already thinking with this time, it was also a good thing for me to realize at the end that all of this work that I had thought through, worked with, was um, by people whose work centers black women. So um, when I think of that particular work, I also um, think of Audre Lorde's the, er the Uses of the Erotic because it informs how I think about it. So when I use the erotic, when I use the word erotic, it is in this Lordian sense of examining the ways in which the world can be different and with the feminist impulse that it is an assertion of the life force of women. She talks about the erotic as a deep attention to one's knowledge of their capacity for joy and knowing that to demand it from life. Um, this is also goes back to uh, the cosmopolitan uh, definition of blackness uh, because when Robin Kelly is writing about uh, freedom dreams, she describes the black radical imagination as utopian idealistic in a sense and it is constantly asking questions uh, about what do we want from the culture that we have how do we um, keep more of what we like about what we have and how do we get rid of the things that we do not like um, and so when I think uh, with the erotic still it functions for me as an otherwise epistemology in opposition to Western thought that privileges neutral, dispassionate, critical distance and rationality. So I do really love black women and, you know, I just can't help but even in my thinking, think about that. <laughs> um, so it is my hope that my scholarship is moving within the erotics electrical charge, as Lord calls it, as it is focused on work by, about and for black women. Um, so, just to think about the term cosmopolitan specifically, um, how do I go back? Um, with When Rain Clouds Gather, um, if you have not read the book, I can tell you about it. So the protagonist of the book is Makaya, and he's a political refugee from um, South Africa. And when he gets to this village in Botswana, he says, this is utopia. I've had the greatest dreams about it. So it's a fictional village, um, and it has its challenges. Um, and it's about Botswana on the cusp of independence. And when I was thinking about um, how Posha and Nonto decided to use um, this particular framing as a title for their exhibition. Um, this is an exhibition specifically about black South African women artists, and yet um, Bessie had left South Africa as well uh, because she could not stand it. Um, and also the protagonist in this book 
left South Africa as well for the same reasons. And in a way, while this uh, exhibition is about black South African women artists, it also acknowledges that uh, this is not the nation state, the South African nation state is not one that uh, you can pay allegiance to in that way. Um, and also in thinking about um, when we see us, um, I was thinking about uh, the fact that uh, they used uh, Ava DuVernay's uh, limited series uh, to sort of flip the narrative from um, the Central Park Five story. And um, a concept that I think with still with these exhibitions is this idea of curatorial activism, um, which I think is what um, the curators are doing to sort of um, uh, create canons of uh, black artists. And so um, in creating these canons, there's also, uh, you run into a problem of sort of essentializing blackness. Uh, so my first question <laughs> to uh, Vicky, Vicky Lekone worked on uh, When Rain Clouds Gather as a program coordinator and Tandazani Lakama is the co-curator of When We See Us. Um, so my first question is uh, to think of the ways, what kinds of ways have these, do these exhibitions uh, transgress and uh, not essentialize blackness? Hi. <laughs> um, I think, you know, just to kind of start it off, um, obviously I'm just to state, I'm not speaking on behalf of Portia and Nanto, who are the curators. It's a pity that they couldn't be here. Um, but I, I think one of the first conversations I had with Portia about the show, and this was about a year, maybe a, a year and a half, it went up, um, kind of, and, you know, thinking around um, how to do um, public activations and programs around it, um, because it was a little bit different to. Um, I guess her scholarship um, in the sense that, um, you know, she has a PhD in like moving image, um, contemporary moving image. And I was just like, very interested, you know, very interesting in the sense that, you know, Rain Clouds focuses mostly on uh, modernist South African women. Um, you know, there are obviously a couple of contemporary artists there as well. And I was just like, why? Um, <laughs> and her response was, it's just because it's urgent. Um, and that's kind of stayed with me, um, you know, in, in how I've always thought about it and, and in, in um, you know, how the conceptual of it was kind of selfless in a sense. It's just about like uh, prioritizing the, the urgency of it and not necessarily just doing it because it's popular or because other people are doing it. I'm also very interesting because they've been doing research for it for like almost seven years. So it's been in the works for, um, it's been in the works for a while. Um, but yeah, I think that there's a, that's a pretty important point in which that it, it, it does that. It frames um, blackness as something that's kind of um, very important to put to the forefront. Um, um, and I know that, you know, it's probably like another point about um, the canon, but in terms of like inserting South African black women into the art historical canon, which may not always be the case. So, yeah. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so in terms of when we see us and um, the question of essentialism and blackness, um, right from the get-go, it was important for us to show a multiplicity and to complicate um, ideas around blackness. Um, and so when we talk about uh, black figuration, um, which we're talking about it in a very encompassing and broad term um, within the When We See Us exhibition. And it's not so much about um, locating uh, very like specific, well, in some instances it is, but it's, it's more about um, thinking about blackness as a utopia, black consciousness, the black experience. And so of course um, that is um, nuanced and we wanted to, to show um, 
how that term um, is multivocal in, in, in essence, um, which sounds contradictory. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you think about blackness, blackness, the term blackness means different things in different geographies. And if you look closely at the biographies or the, the, the way different artists paint in the show, um, you will see that. So the term colored in South Africa means something different in a space like the United States. Um, within blackness, there's um, lots of forms of syncretism and creolization. Um, think of terms like Matisse or Mulatto. Um, and then that's even complicated further if you think about um, black movements and the intergenerational cross-continental conversation. So it was important for us to, for, to be able to offer people that view. And um, I mean, we have almost 200 paintings in the exhibition. And we do hope that people, that multiplicity comes out um, as people navigate through the show. And what was quite interesting is that even though this is, when we see us as a show about the black experience um, and blackness is at the center of it, there's some artists who we included in the show who actually refuse that term or who don't want to be limited by that term, whereas some artists feel like it adds to their practice. Um, and we wanted that complex narrative to be in there as well. Um, and I think at the center of when we see us is this desire to stay away from um, harmful stereotypes and tropes. And um, it came from a place where, um, as Mirembe pointed out, there's so many ama amazing shows on blackness, um, especially that have taken place in the last five years. And so it was important for us to show a historical continuum and to remind people that the conversations we're having today, these urgent conversations we're having today, are rooted in, um, in incredible movements that have gone before. So it was uh, important to have that 100-year framework as well. OK. Um, the next time, thank you so much. The next time that I do want to talk about is um, pastiche. Uh, it's a French word that uh, means paste. Um, and it is an artistic work in a style that imitates that of an another work artist or period. Um, and in a conversation, uh, Arthur Jaffa is a filmmaker. Um, in an interview that he was having, um, he calls um, the culture production, the kind of culture production that focuses on uh, a lack of canons, uh, creating within an absence of materials as a pastiche. Um, and he says that, but at the same time, when you use the word pastiche, it has a slightly negative connotation, as if it is less authentic. Black being is completely bound up in untenable circumstances. Black people figured out how to make culture in free fall. We are a nation, but we have no land. There is no constitution of black culture. Um, and I was thinking about this term specifically with the Kerry James Marshall effect. Uh, that's Koya's term. Um, there's a number of works in the show uh, that do have this Kerry James Marshall effect. And uh, yeah, they do look like that. Um, and in some ways, for me, this points to um, how uh, the art market has sort of uh, made these uh, sort of um, paintings, the kinds of pa paintings that are dominant on the art market right now. Um, and there is a historical continuum, as you have said, uh, but also for me, this is one of the ways I, that I was uh, thinking about how in some ways it essentializes blackness. Um, and so to think about if these exhibitions are creating uh, sort of canons, are they creating uh, black canons? What kinds of black canons are they interested in creating? Um, that's a massive question and I'd love to hear how you answered it in your, in your research. Um, 
Um, but I think, I think in short, I think, uh, well, I hope uh, an exhibition like When We See Us does contribute to the black canon. And when we were doing um, research towards the exhibition, we were looking at different um, canons as well. So I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting myself. So yes, because of the nature of the exhibition being um, an exhibition by black artists, it does show how black artists have contributed to the black canon. But at the same time, um, those artists also speak to other types of canons. And I kind of like that multiplicity. So a part of me doesn't want to just think of a black canon because I, you know, it's, it goes back to um, um, the idea of like, why, why do you have to call an artist a black artist? Why can't an artist just be an artist? So at what point do we, what point do we get to, to, what point do we free ourselves from always having to put our black bodies in the foreground in order to discuss humanity? Um, so it sounds contradictory, but that's how I would answer that. Okay, how I answered the question, I guess, uh, within my research uh, was to sort of, I don't know if I should be saying, but um, to sort of complicate um, this Kerry James Marshall effect and how um, these paintings are sort of everywhere now. Um, I think for me, it speaks to, they don't translate in different contexts in the same way, in the original context in which Kerry James Marshall uh, used this. And it kind of feels like it is responding to uh, a certain force within the market. And for me, it is disturbing because we do know that most of the people who are collecting this work are not black people. And uh, I don't want to think of it in that way, but sometimes I wonder if uh, the black artists who are painting in this way are sort of doing a black face for the, you know. Uh, so yeah, that is how I answered it. <laughs> and that is why I asked, because I did not want to answer it. But yeah. <laughs> very controversial, but I remember reading, I'm going a little bit off topic. But I remember reading a very interesting article um, by um, Nomuri Samakubu, um, kind of also problematizing the idea of um, Somnyama and Gunyama being blackface. And just, anyway, um, which I guess is a conversation on its own. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I agree with 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 um, what Tandazani said in the sense that you know, it's. It's, it's a little bit loaded to try to say that, you know, the canon can only be black. And I think that, you know, a really great thing that, you know, Rain Cloud did was to kind of say, you know, first of all, women are not just like ceramicists or they don't just do tapestries, you know, they also paint, they also draw, they also take photographs. Um, but also they don't just focus on being women, you know, they focus on love and pleasure and, you know, they focus on politics and, um, they can explore their traumas in very different ways. You know, they're not just like spiritual and um, matriarchal. Um, so it's very, it's kind of, it's, 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 it's very wide and, it, and, it, and it, I think it's very important for it to be um, um, multiverse and, and, you know, to, to focus on, on different aspects of what a single person can be, um, a single subject can be, a single topic can be, um, a single medium can be. Um, and I think that it's very interesting to see it um, from particularly black women, um, but also from 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read a poem. It's called The Museum by Richard Seiken. It goes. Two lovers went to the museum and wandered the rooms. He saw a painting and stood in front of it for too long. It was a few minutes before she realized he had gotten stuck. He was stuck looking at a painting. She stood next to him, looking at his face and then the face in the painting. What do you see? She asked. I don't know, he said. He didn't know. 
She was disappointed, then bored. He was looking at her face and she was looking at her watch. This is where everything changed. There was now a distance between them. He was looking at her face, but it might as well have been a cabbage or a sugar bit. Perhaps it was something about yellow near pink. He didn't know how to say it. Years later, he still didn't know how to say it, and she was gone. So I think that's a very beautiful poem. Uh, but um, I feel like that's also what happened to me when I saw photographs by Ruth Motel in the um, When Rain Clouds Gather exhibition. And so the next term that I do want to talk about is syncopation, which is a musical term uh, that refers to a disturbance or interruption of the regular flow of rhythm. It's a temporary displacement of the regular metric metrical accent in music caused typically by stressing the weak bit. Um, and how I came to this term was basically looking at the years in which this photographs were taken. So the photographs in the When Rain Clouds Gather exhibition by Ruth Motel, I think she's the only photographer in the exhibition, are taken in 1990, 1980s. Um, and none of them are about protest or about struggle or about activism in that sense. Um, the most fascinating thing to me about these photographs is they're taken in hostels and uh, the women, as you can see, are lounging, they're relaxing, they're, you know, just living their lives. Um, and so it was, I come to the term syncopation because at first I was thinking about it as this is a counter history of like South African history because uh, it's different to the mainstream narrative of South African history. Uh, but then I came to the term syncopation because um, I think it was happening alongside uh, this other history, not necessarily um, in opposition to it. Um, so I think her, her photographs, Ruth Motel's photographs um, in private and domestic spaces, um, which were scenes of subjection, um, reflect an attention to black sociality that is uncontained by its compromised conditions. In an interview that I did with her, she said she spent a lot of time in these places because she felt like she belonged there. And you can tell in the way that she takes these photographs that her subjects are very comfortable with her. She looks to be in conversation with them. Um, and there is ease and comfort um, in the way that they're unbothered, just, you know, living their lives. And it's almost contrary to the logic of photography, which is to capture, to shoot, to take. Um, which subconsciously reinforces the practice of photography as an extractive one. Um, so I think of uh, the photographs that she takes as rather framing uh, black sociality in that way. Um, and so my question to both of you is about what kind of histories uh, do you think these two exhibitions are recovering or trying to surface, um, bringing to the fore in the maybe choosing of the artist or, you know? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think with, with rain clouds, it's quite distinctly put in the, in the curatorial statement that it's, um, histories that were ignored, um, you know, quite bluntly, um, and I and I, which obviously is like a, a really big focus, and sp again speaks to the urgency that you know um, Portia states, um, well stated to me informally, um, which I think you know is, is kind of is kind of very interesting, um, you know, just to you know, for the fact that there were about um, more than 100 artists who weren't featured in the exhibition but were um, acknowledged as contributors of this history, um, a lot of whom people had never heard of. Um, I think um, something that's very special was how many people were coming to see the exhibition, like, oh my God, who's Valerie Desmore? Um, and, you know, actually turned out to be, in my opinion, one of the greatest um, you know, painters of, of her time. Um, and I think it's it's really important to, um, you know, 
give um, yeah props to that kind of scholarship um, and you know the fact that you're doing your entire research <laughs> on it I am I, th I think is also quite important um, but also just just also just um, seeing the ways in which um, young contemporary artists are just like inspired to work with the works and works that they'd never seen or heard of or engage in it in a very different ways. Um, people who are visiting a museum for the first time and they just like, people my, mother, people my mother's age can, you know, did this. And I think it's very, um, yeah, I think it's kind of like a, a very crucial um, insertion um, into the narrative, um, yeah. Um, so I think when we see us um, attempts to do a, a lot of things or to to point to so many different histories, um, it's an evocative exhibition. It's not representational because that would be impossible to represent everything and to be exhaustive. Um, but I think there's I don't kind of, not invisible, but they are threads of, um, we were really thinking about um, pan-Africanism, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movements, um, negritude, um, Black Lives Matter, and um, thinking about the context of those movements and trying to trace a different um, narrative through painting, through figuration. Um, and in so doing, there are lots of other multiple histories that um, we hope are evoked through the show. Um, so you think about, for example, some of the triangle workshops that happened in Southern Africa. You look at one artist like Ibrahim El Salahi and you start tracing his contribution to um, the, the art canon in the North and figuration, and then it leads to abstraction. You think of like the Weyer movement, um, you, you, it forces you to sort of discuss um, missionary-led initiatives versus some of the informal or seemingly informal pedagogies. Um, and you can't help but think about Nsuka or um, Makerere and see how um, different artists, basically tracing all of these artistic lineages. And so, because it's so big and it's so broad, and it's a hundred years of black figuration in painting, what we hope is that people can look at a thread and pull it and, and find something interesting for themselves through that exhibition. I also just, just want to say, um, um, I think the curators of Rain Clouds were very kind of clear on the fact that the exhibition is not trying to answer questions. In fact, it's actually, the, its intention is to ask more questions. So I think that that speaks very importantly to that point. You know, it's not, it's not there so that it can be like, oh my God, look at what we found, but more what, what else can we find, you know? So. Okay, and I also think when Rain Clouds uh, Gather did that quite well with the uh, living uh, questions open to be answered with, the itinerant archive that they have done, which has been evolving over time, uh, almost until uh, I think last week when I went to see it, they were still, I was like, okay, they added stuff. Okay, great. Um, so I think that has been interesting. Um, the other term that I have been thinking with is frottage, um, which is a term that um, scholar, Kenyan scholar like Guru Masharia writes about in his book, um, Frottage, Frictions of Intimacy Across the Black Diaspora. So frottage is sort of like when you rub and then something stays after you have rubbed, like on a surface that has patterns on it. Um, and Masharia theorizes it as an attempt to forge aesthetics and culture and politics uh, and history from the shared capture of blackness. Um, and what I want to ask is something that I have also asked Koya before, just the importance of having these exhibitions in Cape Town. Um, for example, why not have Werner and Clouds gather in Johannesburg or, you know, 
why was it important for these exhibitions to be located here? Um, well, I love that you have a, 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 an image of Michelaine Thomas on the screen. Um, and it reminds me of how the first time I ever saw Michelaine Thomas's work was in Toronto, Canada. And so I had to be overseas to see um, works like Jacob Lawrence. Um, so it actually, it's actually very heartwarming to be able to, to um, it was heartwarming for us as a team to be able to bring works from different parts of the world where, that normally wouldn't be shown together and to see them on my home soil, like African soil. Um, and so it was very important. So I think that's significant that a lot of these works um, are currently on African soil right now in conversation with um, contemporaries or um, we're able to have these intergenerational conversations through these paintings. Um, but also, um, I think it also reminds us that a lot of artists were in conversation or they cross paths or they exchange, or those are cross pollination of ideas um, in the last 100 years. So Jacob Lawrence spent a lot of time in um, Nigeria. Um, Sekoto and Benin Wunwu um, briefly shared a studio in Paris and um, a whole bunch of them were at Festac 77 and ICAC as well. And um, you can start again these threads, like you can start, it opens up so many other things. And so it's kind of cool that um, we, we can show Haitian artists next to artists from Zambia um, and Congolese artists next to artists from you know, Sudan. So yeah. Is it okay if I just rephrase a little bit? Um, please go ahead. You were part of <laughs> some of these processes, so please go ahead. Um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is what would be the difference between having when we see us in Cape Town as opposed to, say, Harare? <laughs> I mean, I think for me, it's my answer is similar. Um, and, and just so everyone knows, when we see us, we'll travel. We can't announce to where yet because we're finalizing those details. So it'll be interesting to see what happens as the exhibition travels to different locations. Um, but again, I think um, for me, still in Harare, which is only two hours away, um, two hours by flight away, um, I think it's still the same thing about being able to um, experience these incredible artists from all over the continent, all over the world, in one space on the African soil. I think it's really significant. Um, I can't speak to the decision of having it particularly, you know, um, in the space, um, just because I wasn't part of that process. Um, <laughs> but, but also, I think you know, the reality is that we don't necessarily have a deep culture of museum going in South Africa. There aren't a lot of places to, you know, produce these exhibitions in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, in Durban. Sure, like there are places there, but I think that um, sometimes, you know, opportunities lend itself to a very specific time, place and moment and you kind of just have to go for it. Um, thank you. I have these two images up. Um, the painting is by Michaelin Thomas, Never Change Lovers in the Middle of the Night. And the photograph is Robert Motene and Poili Poswayo uh, in Midlands 1997 by Ruth Motau. And um, still thinking with Frotage as affective and bodily proximity. Um, uh, as kinship, as dissonant freedom-seeking intimacy. Um, Frotage provides a framework for thinking about the active and di dynamic ways that blackness is produced and contested and celebrated and lamented. Um, and this theoretical framework offers me a way to think about the rubbing produced uh, by and as blackness uh, when you assemble 
different histories together. And I just want to use that to segue into the last part of this, which is uh, the black queer. Um, and this is a part that I really enjoyed um, writing. Uh, at Noble Foundation, they did a whole event around this photograph um, back in June, which was very interesting because they did this event on June 16th which is a public holiday in South Africa to, I think it's Youth Day, yeah. Uh, and there's a very particular history about that day, about how that day came about and why it is celebrated. Uh, and I found it very important that on this particular day that is a day to um, celebrate that history, the Nova Foundation chose to um, celebrate this image and have uh, a whole event around it. Uh, and Ruth Motau was talking about how this was the first gay wedding that they were having in 1997 in Soweto and the whole village was very excited about it and everyone was going to it whether invited or not. And I found that really interesting. Uh, so for me, it was a way to think about how do we think about blackness and queerness as the same thing uh, without them being separate uh, because sometimes when we are thinking about queerness or when we think about blackness it's almost like the two cannot ex coexist in one um, and so uh, I like to use the term black queer um, which uh, for me is blackness and I use it as a lowercase term and it is blackness that is neither capitalized nor propertized via the protocols of Western grammar. It is a blackness that centers those who are typically regarded as lesser and lower cases, as it were. I know it's very important to tend to that we use capital B black. Um, I also, I use black queer to foreground a view of blackness and queerness as mutually constitutive uh, and black queer as a way of life and black queer in the black feminist tradition of practicing a restlessness of word and phrase to seek otherwise ways of existence. Uh, and I use black queer as somewhere in between and somewhere beyond, and black queer as escaping legibility, and black queer as the right to opacity, and black queer as a political demand, and black queer as excess desire, and black queer as a social experience, as improvisation, as an affective register of physical and material re reality, as a fugitive space, as nothing more than vernacular loneliness. I use it also as an epistemological category, after and within Orgelot's use of the erotic as power. Um, I use black queer as thinking of how to make life more possible as a poetic revolution, as a disavowal of the dichotomy between the spiritual and the political, as emphasizing joy. Uh, and these particular works, uh, I think for me were important in thinking through that. Um, and my last question to both of you, um, just going off uh, emphasizing joy, which I hope <laughs> is something that is important to uh, these two exhibitions. Uh, which particular works stand out for you in the sense that they emphasize joy or they speak to something that is important to the political project of these exhibitions? Gosh, it's a very hard question because it is nearly 200 paintings and, and each one adds to the narrative and and I personally think that each one is is important um, and essential. So it's a very difficult one. Um, but I I think I I um, I would choose probably um, Sherry Sharan or or Moke, um, just because of um, the there is something quite comical. Um, in their narratives and but they were saying really important it was very also very important social commentary and um, you know these were Congolese artists painting at a very particular time there were also sign writers and um, cartoonists and I think sometimes when you think of black figuration you only think of Kerry James Marshall or Charles White or um, 
you know, you think of certain regions in the world, but um, it's nice to, for us to be able to think about Congo and the contribution that Kinshasa has given to the world. But it's a very, I don't have one painting, it's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like, who's your favorite child? Um, <laughs> um, I'm just gonna go with the easy answer and just go with this one, it's here. <laughs> um, I think also because I spent a lot of time with the photograph, um, yeah, because you know I did a very particular piece of programming around it. Um, but it was also just, I guess the, the political behind it was just stood out for me because um, it was literally taken like probably a stone's throw away from like where I grew up um, in a time when I was alive but you know it had no actual like consciousness to whether this existed to whether you know um, women can actually be you know firstly uh, photojournalists but also um, just successful photographers um, but also the subject matter you know ma you know was pretty important to me um, um, yeah yeah <laughs> does anyone have any questions we don't have time okay we can have one or two questions Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Marimbe um, and Tanazanin, for all this like, reflection. And I, I have a, actually more of a short statement. And, and it's also about the kind of the prompts that I, I heard from you aim around the art market and also collecting. And I think it's important that we pull that kind of critical look back also historically. Because I think if the, the, the other narratives that underlies an exhibition like when we see us is the artist that made it who bought it and where it traveled to um, and so there's I hope kind of more scholarship that we can particularly direct towards that and there's also kind of interesting kind of historic moments where a kind of a critique what I which you have um, hinted at which is about the kinds of you know kind of work included in the art market by 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 some black artists or black painters that there's other kind of instances where art is also gets kind of certain success in the market, but also kind of somewhat critiqued also for valid reasons. And I'm thinking about Jacob Lawrence, for example, who kind of gets ostracized by his peers for not being political enough or for participating in the market in a very particular way. But then now we look at, I think, Jacob Lawrence also very differently. Um, so I'm also kind of want us to also like be critical about this and kind of put these also into kind of other kind of conversations too. But I think it's a very important aspect to just to, to mention that. And the, the, the second observation is also just about why exhibitions like rain, rain Clouds or When We See Us is important. It's like, it's what happens with, it's what happens when an exhibition is made. And it's like when objects come to a space that we kind of experience and understand and read and experience and it is also not just a kind of a cognitive, it's also a highly emotive engagement. And so for this, an exhibition like these to kind of also collapse certain kind of like hierarchies. Um, and I think that's the kind of powerful thing that is also about exhibition making and why it's important. Um, and then uh, the last obse observation also, it's interesting that these two exhibitions are made at this point by two private non-profit organizations, but private organizations that also speaks to other kind of kind of what you said, almost like social political issues that kind of govern um, the the way that art is made, seen, and produced, and you know, kind of, and uh, and we're also part of that production as as museums. So, th but thank you so much for um, a great prompt. Okay, uh, I, okay. I never really. So, I love the third question about where do you wish this exhibition could be if it wasn't in Cape Town? Which I kind of do, I want to acknowledge that I think that is a politically tense as representation, as representatives of the organizations that you represent. Probably not wanting to be super direct, but I also want to acknowledge that like each 
part of the continent, like there is something beneficial about not participating in a type of like flattening about it just being on the soil, but knowing that like each part of the soil actually has like different implications in sensory experiences. I think a lot about this when I've had access to certain artists and knowing that I'm in mostly white spaces, thinking about how much I want this particularly in a very specific like black environment and space, right? And so I would actually love to maybe, if you can answer that question again, but maybe with a little political distance from your institutions, like where, <laughs> no, like really, like where would you love to see those exhibitions on the soil in specific geographies? I mean, that, that wasn't really the question, though. <laughs> it, I mean, it was, why is it there? <laughs> um, I mean, look, I think, I think that it's kind of, I think that even a lot of museums in South Africa acknowledge, you know, the kind of accessibility points and, and politics around you know, a lot of private institutions. Is it, would it be great to see a, um, an exhibition like Rain Clouds and Soweto? Absolutely, but it's, you know, again, it's like, we don't necessarily have a culture of museum going. So, you know, I think, I think that, it sounds a little bit like a cop-out, but I, I, I think that sometimes it's important to take an opportunity and go with it when you have the moment to and build from there. So. Um, I mean, it's a very tough, tough question, but of course the utopian dream would be for when we see us to travel to every location that's represented in the museum. But um, that's not realistic, unfortunately. And um, in working, you know, as a team, as we worked through when we see us, um, and thinking about where all the works were coming from, a lot of work from Europe and the United States, um, we've a, a lot can do. We can do a lot more, and hopefully, this is just the beginning of shows like this from different parts of the continent. Um, but if you think of all of the big African shows that are referenced, like Africa Remix and um, Short Century, and all those, very few actually made them their way back. To the to the continent, I think Africa Remix we, uh, was shown at Joburg, but so many shows that we referenced didn't come on African soil. Um, so um, I feel really proud of us that we were able to have a show the magnitude that a lot of institutions said was too ambitious. A lot of institutions from the West expected us to fail, and we didn't. And now they want the show. So um, I'm proud of what we were able to achieve. <laughs> Um, I have a location for you, Lagos. Uh, I think that's where I want the show to go. Because, yes, because it has the biggest population of black people, so they should absolutely see it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm.